All right. Uh, my name is Bill Edwards, and um, I've got a, a remote observatory up in uh, kind of northeast Georgia, near uh, Sharon, Georgia. It's a little town. It's really more of a crossroad than anything else. It's at the Dural Astronomy Village, which is very, very similar to Chase Point. And uh, this is where it started. Uh, Dr. Mike was talking about uh, our first telescope. Well, this was my first telescope, and I'll probably be bringing it next month. Uh, that was a, a Christmas uh, Tasco refractor, and uh, that's what got me started. And it uh, lasted me probably for a few years, and then from there I, I built a, uh, a homemade 8-inch uh, Newtonian on a uh, German equatorial mount and then started doing 35 millimeter uh, astrophotography with that. Uh, that lasted me for a number of years, and then I moved on, and um, ended up with this monster. Uh, this was a 12 inch Mead uh, SCT on a Paramount. Uh, actually, in between there, I started with just a, uh, a Mead 12 inch, put it up on a wedge, uh, got very, very aggravated with trying to do astrophotography with it. Uh, it was a great imaging scope, but a very, very poor astrophotography scope. So I uh, ended up selling that, uh, bought another 12-inch uh, SCT, just the optical tube, uh, got a Paramount mount, and then uh, mounted that and started getting some good results with it. The, uh, the problem with I would, would roll this thing out of my garage every night. <coughs> it would take me about a half hour to polar line it, and uh, then I'd have to wait for, you know, the, uh, I live near NAS. I'd have to wait for the uh, pilots to get out of my way. Uh, seems like I'm on left base for the main runway. So every couple of few minutes, here comes a, a P3 that would come right over the top of my house. Um, so the main problem I was having was uh, air traffic. I only had a southern sky that I could uh, image from. Um, the, um, I have a, under my driveway, I have a, apparently a void. So every time a car would drive past in my neighborhood, the whole mount would shake and would take a couple of minutes for it to settle down. So every time a car would go by, I'd have to stop the image that I was shooting, wait a few minutes for it to settle, start the image over again. And that was just enough time for that car to turn around and come back to buy me again. So it was pretty frustrating. And then over time, um, some of the, the night crowd that was stopping at my house at 2 o'clock in the morning just started to get pretty scary. And I decided it was time to uh, find another location to do my, uh, my imaging from. So I started looking around and, um, and found the Fearless Astronomy Village. And Derelict, as you can see, is um, it's about two hours uh, east of Atlanta. It's about six hours from Jacksonville. Um, it is very dark out there. But the only place you're going to find that it's darker in Georgia is in the middle of the Okefenokee Swamp. And um, so it's, it's, it is pretty good. I have noticed over the last few years we are starting to get a little bit of encroachment of light pollution from some of the, the uh, closer cities. But, uh, but overall, it's very nice. Uh, Derelict is, um, has 100 acres of land out there. Most of that land has been parceled up into roughly two acre lots. And the um, homeowners have either put houses and or observatories up on those lots. And then they've reserved a, um, a field, they call it Greer's Field, which is uh, set up for people to, um, to come out on the weekends or during the week and uh, set up their equipment and do their own observing. Um, they've got restroom facilities, they've got a uh, barn style uh, picnic area, uh, small warm room, so it's pretty nice. The, there are several uh, concrete pads that are out there with power 
Uh, and they, over time, they keep developing it, so it's, it's pretty nice. Um, but the requirements for me at the time was I was looking for dark skies. I wanted some security. <coughs> I did find some areas in South Georgia that uh, were possibilities, but the problem was uh, trying to secure it. And, uh, and know if I came back in another week or two weeks that, that the observatory wasn't going to get broken into. Um, I needed high speed internet access and what I have <coughs> is a fiber connection to the observatory and I can get as much bandwidth as I need out there. Um, and then I need access to uh, other people and uh, fortunately there are no people at here like that in the middle of the night if I run into a problem uh, there's somebody out there that I can call and get them to go out to the observatory and if, if worst case, park the scope and close the roof for me and then I can make arrangements to then get up to the observatory and deal with whatever the problem might be. And that's my observatory. It's a um, 10 by 14 uh, roll-off roof. Um, <coughs> it's a little distorted from my perspective here. Um, I bought it um, as a essentially a shell from someone else who did uh, just visual observing and then basically stripped it down and rebuilt it, the entire observatory. Uh, this is a, just a quick shot of the interior. And that's the new beast. That's a 14-inch uh, uh, RC design, F8 scope. I've got a Takahashi uh, Sky 90 refractor. That's my guide scope. Uh, two cameras that are mounted on it. Um, and then focusers, et cetera, that I can all operate uh, remotely. It's just a list of the a lot of the observatory hardware and software. There are a lot of unique challenges when you're trying to run this thing remotely. Um, again, the way I operate the, uh, the observatory is I go in in the evenings, uh, or actually in the afternoon, and program what I want it to do for that evening. And then um, about an hour or so before sunrise, or sunset, excuse me, it will open the roof and then um, wait for um, the sun to go down to, to power up the, all the equipment and get, let everything start equalizing for temperature. And then it will pan to the sky, focus on a star, move to the object, first object that I want it to image, and then start imaging, tracking that across the sky. Um, does all this automatically. If there's a problem during the night, he calls me, <laughs> and um, so it's a list of some of the hardware to make all that ha happen. Um, I've got a, a weather station there. I've got uh, cloud monitors. I've got sky quality monitors. Uh, some of that data that's collected from that gets pushed out uh, to other organizations. Um, the sky quality uh, monitor, for instance, um, the data from it gets pushed out to two different groups and they collect that data and are doing research with it. Uh, the weather station data is the same thing. I push that up to uh, Weather Underground and a few others. Um, and then a lot of the other equipment, um, the web power switch, um, this is another type of switch. These are switches that I can use to either power on and off the 120 volt equipment or the 12 volt DC equipment. So everything uh, has to be um, set up so that I can uh, individually power things on and off. You know, as you're aware with computers, you're always going to have something that's going to freeze up and lock up. You got to have some way of remotely being able to either if nothing else, recycle it, or at least uh, force that piece of equipment to, um, uh, to reconnect. Um, and that has been one of the real challenges I've had in setting up the observatory is that 
there is no book. You can't go buy a book that says, how do I build a remote observatory? That documentation just does not exist. So you've got to do, do a lot of networking with people who've already trailblazed this and start picking their minds <coughs> on how did they approach some of these problems. And then, um, uh, and then with me, I keep an Excel spreadsheet. Every time I have a little issue come up, it goes on that spreadsheet. And then I'm looking for a solution. To how am I going to resolve this and prevent it from reoccurring? Um, one of the biggest problems I've had in the, uh, the observatory is that a lot of this equipment, uh, things like uh, USB hubs, I go through USB hubs and routers like crazy. And the reason is that that type of equipment is never, was never designed and built to be left essentially outdoors. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, they're meant to be inside of an uh, office environment, a home. And you leave them out and where they're exposed to weather a lot and they just break down. So trying to find more industrial grade uh, hubs, industrial grade routers have been real challenges. Or taking some of that equipment and trying to uh, uh, be creative about covering them so that you keep the dew off of them uh, without overheating the equipment. <coughs> I've had a real problem in the observatory with uh, lightning. Lightning and surges. Um, I was actually in the observatory one night when we had a thunderstorm go through. Lightning hit a pine tree about um, 100 yards away, went down the pine tree, through the ground, up my pier, and then arced across to the, to the uh, UPS. And I was standing about four feet from it at the time. Mm -hmm. Scared the daylights out of me. <laughs> so, and uh, what was funny was the entire observatory went dark, and then the UPS clicked back on, and everything powered right back up. That one I got lucky. Yeah. I have not been as lucky as some of the others. So everything in the observatory is surge protected. All the 12 volt is surge protected. All the 120, all the USB, all the Ethernet. Everything is surge protected, and um, uh, and the, the observatory at the panel has got whole house surge protection. And after having gone through all of that, um, it's gotten better. <coughs> um, just the list of a lot of the software that's employed in the, um, the observatory, and as you can see, it's quite a list. Um, it gets very complicated. I had a friend of mine who, um, not long ago, started down this same route and trying to, um, his is a little easier because his observatory is in his, in his backyard. And what I told him was start taking this in small pieces and implement it. Don't, don't try to do all this at once. You've got to just do it in small increments and just build on it and build on it. Otherwise, you get buried in this because it doesn't take one, one of these pieces to stop working and everything stops working. Um, that's just a, um, one of the pictures I shot. Um, the kind of stuff that I enjoy doing is uh, pro-am projects. Um, year before last, I worked with a professional astronomer out of the Lowell Observatory. And I was on a team of uh, about six other amateurs, and we were shooting uh, objects for this uh, professional astronomer for a project that she was working on. And it just happens to be one of the objects we shot. And that's, it doesn't look like it, but that's essentially 80 hours of luminous data that was shot on that one object. And that's 80 hours I kept for that. I probably shot twice that much and threw away half of it. There's my very first telescope that was taken in front of what was the Children's Museum, uh, probably, I'm guessing, 1970, in a time far, far away. And I'll try and do a 
demo here. What you're seeing right there is a, um, an Allstyle camera that I have. In, and it's just a camera which is pointing straight up in the sky, so you're seeing a um, 360-degree view of the sky. And this is just one of the tools that I use to help me determine whether um, it's clear or not. And this uh, actually just loops uh, about 30 minutes worth of data and loops over and over again. And I've got multiple cameras. That's it's hard to see in here now. But, um, there are two webcams that are mounted inside. Bear with me. And typically, like I said, what I will do in the afternoon is I have a, a product that's called CCD Navigator. And this is a tool, it's a planning tool. And um, I use this to help me uh, determine uh, what's up in the sky that night or in the case of uh, NGC 4700 with the window over here, essentially what time does it come up? That's its highest point. And then that's what time that object sets in the evening. And uh, so I'll take this data, and then over here, it will build in that observation, and then it will export a file, <coughs> which I then push over to the observatory. And once it gets to the observatory, I import that in. We're going to connect to the observatory now. In my observatory, I actually have two PCs running. Um, I have one PC which actually drives the telescope and the cameras, so that's the imaging rig, and a second PC which has all the environmentals on it. So it, it runs the weather station, it runs the, SQ, the sky quality meter, uh, the cloud monitor, etc. And I kind of purposely split that off because Trying to run this all on one single PC uh, was just too much of a load for a single PC. Um, and it increased uh, too much instability on that PC. So by separating some of the stuff out, it just made it the, the environment a lot more stable. So what you're looking at now is a piece of software called um, the SkyX. This is SkyX Professional. And it's a um, planetarium type software, but it also interfaces to the telescope, the, um, the roof, the cameras, the focusers, etc. All of that hardware. And then on top of that, I wrote another piece of software and it's called uh, CC Autopilot. And what we've just done is told Autopilot to go ahead and link. Normally, I would, um, in fact, we're going to do this first. So I just told this guy to connect to the telescope. And because it had been previously powered off, I've got to home the mount, which just means that it's going to move the telescope, put it into a position so that it knows exactly where that telescope is pointing. And it's this right here that it's finding home. And as it does that, it will continue.
now we can go back to CC Autopilot. And I've already programmed in the objects that I wanted to do. Um, <coughs> So this is all real time, right, Bill? That is correct. This is not Memorex, this is the real thing. Right? <laughs> and I'm going to do a small problem. Thank you. It was just taking a 10 second exposure uh, at the moment. And I've got the uh, the observatory pretty much set up now. Right now we're running off of my laptop connected to the observatory. But I can do the same thing with my iPad, and to an, a large extent, I can do the same thing even with my iPhone. It's just trying to work on a screen that small can be difficult. But I have been in here uh, in the meetings before and opened the, the observatory roof and kicked off an imaging run, and would just be sitting there monitoring it while it's running, and then. Uh, and pick back up with it so when I get home. It's much easier to do all this on a big screen than on uh, these small monitors. What it's doing right now is um, it's slewing the, uh, the mount. Um, let me open another one. That's just a little graphic that shows where the, uh, the telescope is pointing. Which is kind of handy. And it's selecting a filter right now. And then what it's going to do is um, take a snapshot, a snapshot, and then it's going to do what's called an image link. And what it will do is take that, that snapshot, snapshot and compare it against a catalog. And it looks to see, um, I, you know, I've told it to go to this object, and with that image link, it compares to see is it really pointing exactly where I told it to go to. And if it's not, it will make a correction and then shoot another snapshot again. When it's done, that object I told it to go to will be dead center, right smack in the middle of the chip. What object did you tell it to? Um, just then, I told it to go to NGC 4700, which is a. I, I'm working on another Pro Am project with a professional astronomer in Germany. 
and, um, and this is a, a galaxy that he wants me to image under either uh, red light or under V with a V filter. And um, you can barely see in this case, that's the galaxy there. It's uh, <coughs> well, the call off the top of my head what the magnitude is, but it's pretty, it's small and it's dim. So it's going to be another one that's going to require uh, a lot of hours to, be, to bring out any kind of detail with it. And, um, yeah, so it's doing an image map right now. I don't know how clear this information is, but it just did a look up. It got the uh, right ascension and declination from the mount, and then compared that image uh, in a star catalog, found it, and now it's feeding corrections to the mount, and it's going off doing another uh, exposure, and then we'll uh, uh, re finish it. That, that object should be dead center in the cross -fairs. It hasn't yet, but will it center that? Yes. We got a little bit of lag that I'm assuming is the communication delay. That's why this keeps slowing down. There it goes. It's centered now. So we could then go in and, and start imaging this object. And uh, typically, um, I can shoot 10 or 15 minutes unguided. And uh, anything longer than that, then I've got to initialize the uh, guide scope and the guide camera, and then um, pick a guide star, and, and then I can, go, I can guide for as long as I need to. Uh, typically, I won't go more than about 20 minutes, so guided. But if I can uh, shoot something unguided 10 or 15 minutes, I'll go unguided. Um, I just seem to have much better luck uh, shooting unguided than guided. Um, and then it will go, just go all night. But with autopilot, I'm going to switch back over to that for a second. <coughs> that I would have told it to go off and shoot for each of those. And it will go out and shoot uh, dark frames. You know, last month we had that um, discussion talking about uh, darks, biases, and uh, flats. Uh, this can do the darks, bias, and flats either at dusk and also at dawn. Um, when it's done, I typically uh, will let it shoot the uh, darks and biases, but flats, I have a, um, um, I just turned on a, a red rope light inside the observatory. <laughs> Those are the two monitors, the PCs. This is a, a light panel. And um, so it's a flat LED light panel. And that's how I shoot my flats. So the, the software is set up, and the red light just came on. Um, uh, that, that particular camera is a Logitech uh, Circle, I think it's what it's called. And, um, so you don't access the image directly. It goes through Logitech, and depending on how busy Logitech is, you'll see a delay. But you can see the telescope right now is moving. It's going to put this telescope back into a park position, and that will clear it so that the roof can then be closed. See the, uh, the scope is almost in yeah. the park position, and I'm going to jump back over here. Wow. There's just a little guy who lives in that house. And then, what was that? Say, there isn't, do you have any kind of 
right there is now telling me it's safe. Do you have smoke alarms and stuff in the thing? Yep. And smoke it'll alarms. let you know it'll call you up or something? Yep. Awesome. Smoke alarms, motion detectors. There's a camera on the exterior, two cameras inside. Uh, any motion on any of those cameras send me alert. Yeah. The red oh. thing. Um, Bill, how much money did you get from your fire insurance? <laughs> oh God, that's, that's a hell of a setup. So it, it's a constant uh, effort to keep it going, I'll tell you that. Um, there are lots of little things that I have to, to play with. Microsoft gives me constant fits. Um, this is running Windows 10 on both of those PCs. How often are you up there? I get up there probably uh, quarterly. So there's there are, there is some preventative maintenance I have to do. Is there a technician up there that can help you? Or? There is somebody that's there that's on call, but what he does, I mean, he's just a, one of the residents that's there. He has his own observatory. He's somewhat familiar with like the Paramount, but uh, but the rest of my setup, no. I mean, if I wanted to like. Oh, it's a specific take my camera theory. down and, yeah. and do something. Could he do that? I wouldn't even ask him to do that. Jesus. The kind of things I've asked him to do in the past is I've run into a problem. And I, I had a problem one night where the um, um, when autopilot started up, it told the mount to home itself, and instead of homing itself, it went the other direction, and the, uh, the optical tube bumped the pier. And then installed them out. Right. And at that point, what do I do? You know, I tried to power the mount off, power it back on, could not do anything with the mount. So I had to call him and get him to just come out there and manually repark the uh, the steel for me. Bill, I saw you obviously the, we, the, we saw the air conditioner on the side. Are you able to manipulate and change your climate control from here? In case, say, it's uh, August 30th and it's 102 there. Yeah, the okay. automation is already set up. It kicks the, this time of year is set up where as soon as it hits 89 degrees inside the observatory, it turns the air conditioner on and runs it until about 8 o'clock at night and then it just shuts it off and it stays off the rest of the night. Any problems with excessive humidity? It, it's always humid there. <laughs> Air conditioner or not, it is yeah. always humid there. Um, the observatory is uh, insulated. That helped uh, greatly. Um, there were good points and bad points about doing that. I, I put up this um, radiant barrier insulation in there. And when I did that, it dropped the temperature inside the observatory probably 20 degrees. The downside is, you open the roof, <coughs> it holds the temperature for probably a good hour and a half every night. So it takes a while for that heat to get out of the observatory. So. Awesome. Any more questions? That's amazing, man. Thank you. Thank yeah, you so you. much. Yeah.